This part two revolves around the causation of the Deepwater Horizon disaster and what we've been able to glean from the public records and records that have been submitted to public agencies. The slide you're seeing now is a picture of the Deepwater Horizon rig being moved around on a huge ocean-going vessel. Um, this should give you an idea of how massive uh, this piece of equipment is. Uh, it's an ultra-deep water, dynamically positioned, semi-submersible drilling rig built in 2001. It represented the cutting edge of technology capable of working in up to 10,000 feet of water. And it had a rate of approximately a half a million dollars a day. A very expensive piece of equipment to rent. And obviously, if you're delayed in your project, then you're going over budget, which is one of the reasons we think the disaster occurred. Um, the contributing factors to the disaster that we've been able to identify is the fact that BP used an improper well design, a bad cement job, possible casing collapse, ignored a failed pressure test, damaged the annular preventer, no cement bond log run, improper decision to displace the riser and place the balance plug through seawater, and a non-functioning blowout preventer. I know that all sounds very complicated, um, and some of it is, but in reality, it's all very simple. In this business of investigating these kind of disasters, you come into what's called a cascading effect. What happens is a uh, small little errors in and of themselves which would not cause a disaster when combined with numerous other small little errors cascade into a huge disaster and that's what happened in this particular case. BP used a risky casing design typically reserved for known formations. Now what does that mean? That means that this was an exploratory well, this formation was not well known, um, BP should have used a much more conservative casing design when completing this well and instead BP used a risky casing design. The design that they used allowed an open pathway for oil and gas to go up the annulus, which we talked about earlier, into uh, the blowout preventer. Counter to safe procedure, the design allows this pathway and despite the increased risk of a blowout, the design was chosen by BP because it was the quote, the best economic case, end quote, i.e. it was cheaper. Um, I'm going to show you a series of British Petroleum documents that we uh, have obtained. Um, basically, initially, uh, the keeper well options, this was the keeper well, was to use a long string of 9 and 7 8 inch, 7 inch casing, which was the primary option. However, the engineers stated that cement simulations indicate it is unlikely to be a successful cement job due to formation breakdown. Uh, and that this particular type of casing design was unable to fulfill MMS regulations of 500 feet of cement above uh, the top producing zone. Uh, it also provided an open annulus to the wellhead. So, since then the engineers decided to, that it would be appropriate in that circumstance to use a 7-inch liner, uh, is, which was now the recommended option, to put that liner inside of the string um, so that it would be a further barrier and protection to uh, possible problems with the well. Uh, that obviously uh, cost more money and so the engineers then decide that the uh, long string uh, without the liner is again the primary option because their simulations now indicated that it's possible to obtain a successful cement job and that it was possible to fulfill the MMS regulations. Uh, they do acknowledge there's risk if losses occur to have an open annulus to wellhead and they need to verify other situations with law, uh, cement bond log, etc. However, it states, quote, the best economic case and well integrity case for future completion operations. In other words, it was going to be easier to complete and cheaper to install.